Hey, this is Zelda Adams, one of the filmmakers of Where the Devil Roams, and you're listening to ContraZoom. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> This is ContraZoom, where we go back and forth about film. I'm your host, Dakota Arsenault. On today's show, we are starting our Fantasia Festival coverage on the podcast side. If you've been to our website, ContraZoomPod.com, in the past week or so, you'll notice a bunch of reviews have popped up, including Baby Assassins 2, A Disturbance in the Force, How the Star Wars Holiday Special Happened, and River, among others. Today, we have two amazing interviews to share with you. First up are the directors from the documentary Satan Wants You, which explores the origins of the satanic panic in the 80s and 90s, and how it can all be traced back to a book called Michelle Remembers, about a doctor and patient in Victoria, British Columbia. I first saw Satan Wants You back at Hot Docs, where I wrote a review for the film, and it will be linked to in the show notes. The second interview I have is with the filmmakers behind Wonder Wheel Productions in their new movie Where the Devil Roams. The Adams Family writes, directs, stars, and does everything else imaginable to make their own movies. I first came across them last year at Fantasia in their film Hellbender and was excited to formally interview them after chatting with them a little bit on social media. The movie is about a traveling carnival in Depression-era New York State and a murderous family of performers played by the Adams Family themselves. I'll also link to the review I wrote for Where the Devil Roams in the show notes. Without further ado... Here are Fantasia Festival interviews. Joining me now from Victoria is Michelle Smith, a one-time victim of abuse by a satanic cult, and Dr. Lawrence Pazder, the psychiatrist who helped her come to terms with that nightmare. The book is called Michelle Remembers. Michelle Remembers. We wrote it we together. Wrote it together. The first publicized account of such rituals. They would put me in cages, sacrifice animals, eating feces and orgies and dismembering fetuses. These were things that you experienced. That's right. Today, I am joined by Steve J. Adams and Sean Horler, the directors of the new documentary Satan Wants You, playing at this year's Fantasia Festival. The film looks back at the seminal book Michelle Remembers that tell the story about how a patient named Michelle Smith reveals to her therapist, Dr. Lawrence Pazner, how she was given to a satanic cult by her mother as a child and spent 14 months being tortured. The success of the book launched a satanic panic in the 80s and 90s where everything from rock music to Dungeons and Dragons were labeled as satanic. I originally saw the film Satan Wants You back during Hot Dogs and absolutely loved it. Welcome, Steve and Sean. How are you both doing today? Great. Thanks for having us. Can I steal that summary? It was really good. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Uh, now, you both are from Vancouver, and the event of the Michelle Remembers book occurred just a ferry ride away in Victoria, British Columbia. I would love to know your introduction to the material. Was it something you grew up with, or did the book come to you both later in life? Yeah, I mean, I I am from Victoria, so this is I grew up with this story. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, I'm gonna have a just a spoiler alert for your listeners. Close your ears for a second. Uh, I, you know, Michelle and Larry lived in a big house by the ocean, ten minutes down the road from my family. So, uh oh. Yeah. So this is like they were larger than life figures in the community. They're in the newspapers, on the radio, on TV. This is like. You know, I thought this was just happening at the time, a local story, and it wasn't until Steve and I started looking into this all these years later that it became clear that they, you know, it wasn't just 1980 when the book came out that they were, you know, giving interviews and saying these things. This went on for the entire length of the satanic panic, and they ended up consulting on thousands of cases and interviews for over a decade talking about all these satanic ritual abuse uh, memories that Michelle had. It's just a crazy, crazy story. Wow. What about you, Steve? When were you exposed to the book? 
Um, it wasn't until 2018. We were, Sean and I were working on a different project about books and authors in BC. And our researcher had provided us with about 100 books. And like midway through was this book, Michelle Remembers. I had never heard of it. But when Sean saw it, he was like, oh my God, this book. And that's kind of like when we began to, to look at the book. And at that time, um, QAnon and Pizzagate were like roaring across the internet. Um, and we started to look at the book, started to do the research and we saw the similarities between the two. And we were like, kind of like flabbergasted. We were like, wow, this is like, it's happening again. And we just thought it was such an interesting story. Wow. Well, I'm glad you have both brought it back to the, the mainstream again, because I always sort of knew about the satanic pick, but I didn't know it actually originated in Canada. So it's pretty crazy to see how it all got started. Yeah, it's a, a secret about Victoria. And, and I mean, this is, you know, a part of Canadian history that everyone should know about, at least, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know we've made a documentary film, and we're a little bit biased about this. But it's surprising how many people have never heard this story, even if they have understood about the broader uh, global panic that sort of followed the publication of Michelle Remembers. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, speaking of the actual film itself, documentary reenactments can kind of be a tricky thing to do as you don't want to take away from real footage or photographs, but you also want to dramatize key events that you don't have the actual footage for. I found that you balance this wonderfully by basically having reenactments of the therapy sessions and then dubbing them over with the actual audio recordings of Michelle's therapy sessions. How did you come to present the audio tapes in this manner? And how did you balance the act of striving for realism in a documentary and including stage scenes to emphasize certain Certain moments? Well, I, I think for us, we, we really needed to, I mean, obviously, we, we didn't have the footage of Michelle and Larry during their therapy sessions. Um, but we were able to get our hands on one therapy tape. And listening back to the tape and knowing what the contents of the book were, and, and knowing that this was kind of this story that was repressed memories, and now know that like nothing was real in the book, it felt like it gave us the creative um, bandwidth to kind of to, to go into a different realm where we, we could tell these like reenactments that were done with style um, that wouldn't detract from what was actually being said in the film. And I think that's kind of like where we landed when we when we wanted to do the reenactments. If I can add to what Steve just said, too, you know, I found a photo in an old People magazine from 1980 and this for, for us was like a huge creative, okay, here's opportunity for us. It was a still of, from a video that Larry, uh, Michelle's doctor had taken. And he, he, you know, they filmed or they recorded 600 hours of audio tapes along with video. So he had all, all of this old video footage that we could not find. But seeing that photo in the People magazine, it showed us what his office looked like, how Michelle laid on the couch. Uh, for us to take that and then give it to a production designer and say, we want you to re replicate this and then bring to, to life the rest of the office. Like it, it wasn't straying too far from reality for us because we knew this video existed. And it, it was a like creative license for us to say, let's build out this world and let's actually show what these sessions look like because it was already done originally. Wow, that, that came in really clutch. And I'm glad you were able to, to accurately rebuild the therapy room, the, the doctor's office. It's pretty cool. Thanks. Um, now, speaking of the audio tapes, hearing them, what you play in the movie of Michelle Smith therapy, screaming in agony, describing these really brutal uh, things that may or may not have happened to her, depending on, you know, Michelle's uh, vision you want to believe there. Uh, but it's quite disturbing to listen to, even if we, you know, learn the validity of her claims or not quite how she presents them. I imagine having to sit through, you said you only got the one tape, uh, sit through that was still quite taxing. How did you decide what clips to include and what was not as relevant to the story you want to tell? I think when we got the tape, um, Sean, is it, was the tape 60 Minutes? Both sides. There, there's two, so it was actually like two audio tapes um, from different sessions combined onto one cassette. Yeah. So like a reel-to-reel -reel machine, somebody, one of the um, transcribers had combined it onto a tape cassette to then uh, transcribe from. It was quite the process, but yeah. sorry, Steve, you're going to... Yeah, yeah. I, I, when you actually like listen back to the tape, like honestly, like I would say like 70% of the tape is actually just like Michelle screaming. Like there, there isn't a, a whole lot of um, like her speaking, but when you go through and you, you listen to what the tape is, you can go into the book and directly reference and see 
exactly what she was saying. So like when we're looking at the book and listening to the tape, we're like, we, we can actually like bring this right in because it is like verbatim in the book. So we used as much as we could. And I, and I think we, we used the majority of what was on that tape. And it was like really uncomfortable to listen to. But then, and I don't want to spoil anything else in the film, you'll see a final scene in the film that might change how you feel about us using material from the tape as well when, when you finally see Satan wants you. But it was that, that sort of the screaming, the memories, then other discussion between Larry and Michelle recorded in the session. It's, it is an experience. Mm -hmm. Now, you said you only received one tape. Was this because that's all that exists still or is that all that was made available to you? all we could get um really? we tried really really hard to to get our hands we knew that there was um in the book when you go through uh all of the credits and the acknowledgements we knew that there was transcribers we knew that there was a group of people who had access to the tapes so it was very methodical and we went through and we tried to contact everybody we knew that there had to be something out there um and fortunately for us we were able to get one but that was all we were able to get our hands on well you still made great use of it <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, you also staged the movie in a very fascinating way. Without giving too much away, you drop all these little nuggets and unravel the story in such a way that by a certain point, I'm basically yelling at the screen asking simple evidence based questions like, did anyone look into Michelle Smith's school records from the area that she supposedly went missing for 14 months as a child? And then, when I'm at my, my peak frustration with the characters in this story, you pick the perfect time to reveal specific relevation. Rel revelations that turn the story uh, on its head. Can you talk about your process of story writing and editing to craft such an engaging story? Yeah, I mean, this this from the very beginning, um, after we, uh, you know, had started research and then got funded, this is how uh, we pictured the story being told. Um, like, I really wanted uh, people to experience the Michelle remembers story as they would have in 1980. So it's like you'll see in the first part of the film, if you were reading newspapers, watching TV from 1980 to 1985, this is what you would have seen without any expert commentary about what's happening behind the scenes, without any testimonial from Michelle and Larry's family. It was so important to actually like structure the movie this way. And it really worked. Like there is a, you know, in terms of, of story structure, there is a turning point exactly in the middle of the movie. And the fact that this all worked out and that our editor, Graham Q, you know, took this idea and ran with it and made it a, a million times better than anything that I could have put on paper and that Steve and I could have brainstormed and, and put into it, beat sheets. It just, I don't know, we're, we're really lucky. I'm glad you feel that way about how it was told. <laughs> yeah, and it's and I know I'm not the only person that feels that way because uh, my co-host Rachel Ho also watched and we were having a discussion about the movie and we both felt very similarly about how we were, we were very frustrated with these characters. It's like, how come no one is really looking into their background? And then you drop like a few little bombs. It's just like, oh my god, I can't, I can't believe this. This is wild. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that the most wild part is that there were these investigators that went and saw this and like looked at it and was like, obviously this isn't true. But let's figure it out. And like to to actually disprove it was quite simple. Like it was just like like going to the school to find the yearbook. Like it it was very it was a very simple thing to do. But nobody like still after like this was released, nobody believed it. Like they they still wanted to go with like this overarching like story of that Satanists were in every community and they were stealing babies. Like it it was what's the the saying, Sean? The the that lies have circled the the world before the truth has even done its shoelaces up. Like you know, like there's this like <laughs> a lie will spread so much faster than the truth. It seems. Mm -hmm. And it almost sort of reminds me a little bit of a few years ago when there was, I think it was like the New York Times reporter that was doing an investigation into Donald Trump Jr. And then it was like, he just tweeted out my entire two years worth of, of research I was doing. He just tweeted it out. And that's what it sort of felt like this, where it's like, I just looked in a yearbook and there it was. <laughs> <laughs> It was just one of those things where it's like, how stupid can some people actually be? But, you know, uh, as you've said, the lies travel around the world faster than truth can put their shoelaces on. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> uh, but I want to talk about uh, the media a little bit and, and sort of seeing the complicity of, of mainstream media and the rise of the satanic panic is one of the more frustrating things. Obviously, network executives and producers of news and talk show programs are more interested in attracting viewers than they are telling the truth. But you watch the clips from from people like Larry King and Oprah and Sally Jesse Raphael in this film, and you're just baffled how just everyone went along with these lies with zero pushback whatsoever you know there's a scene of like three women talking about how they were breeders for satan and it's like how can everyone in this newsroom do this interview with a straight face and it's just like what role in ethics do you think these infotainment programs should have done at the time and do you think they've gotten any better you know we were just um chatting with somebody about this and when you when you look at what was happening with daily talk shows, they were chasing ratings. They were they were everybody was trying to outdo each other, and so you watched the the content of these shows get crazier and crazier. And because this was so loud on one side, the news had to talk about it, and then the news had to bring on both sides of the conversation, which also just like fueled it. So you'd see this on the daytime talk shows, and then you would hear it on the news. So it would reinforce your beliefs and people just wanted more of it because they wanted to know what was actually happening. And it was just this like this really cyclical thing that was just like, it was chasing each other around and around and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and just kind of got out of control. I would say though, before it even got to that stage, right? There is a chain of, of, basically a chain of belief that happens to even make it a a mainstream news story, right? You have somebody like Michelle recovering memories of satanic ritual abuse that happened to her as a child, uh, either with the help of or seeking help from her psychiatrist, who then takes it to the church, who says this is also real, who then takes, you know, it becomes a police matter, uh, re- religious police officers, crop, cops for Christ, look into it and say, this is real. Psychiatrists look at what Larry did and his rituals about, or his theories about satanic ritual abuse and say, this is true. Let's include it in our professional diagnostic manual. And it goes up from there, right? Before it's, before it's even mainstream media, it's all these experts and all these pillars in society who are saying this is happening. And then, you know, like any good conspiracy theory, it doesn't even matter if there is evidence because the lack of evidence is evidence itself. So it's, and I understand that the media are culpable in this, but it is like a systematic wide societal failure that leads to this happening. Yeah. And you guys do a good job of uncovering the the follow the money route where it's like, okay, who is saying this and why, what's their motive behind that? And you you do that both for the actual literal money where we find out that the book was subsidized by the church, but then also stuff like looking back at, at Dr. Pasner's past of like his trips to Africa and being like, oh yeah, he witness these rituals in an African country, but didn't understand what they were. And then just assume that they were, you know, satanic Catholic sort of uh, rituals that were going on. And so I appreciate that you kind of follow the trails, both ends to understand exactly where everyone is coming from. Yeah. And it's a weird place to be where everyone has a piece of the blame, you know, or almost everyone. I can't, you know, use a, a paintbrush that big, but it is, and you sort of see this. I mean, when we started working on this film in 2018, it was right after Pizzagate and when QAnon was picking up steam and suddenly children uh, were being shipped in furniture. And like, I don't know, it's easy to forget that this just happened within the last decade and has now expanded into targeting drag queens and targeting transgender uh, folks in the transgender community with these same rumors of grooming children and all like it's the same thing over and over and over again Mm -hmm. and just when you think oh no the satanic panic's over it just Mm -hmm. keeps keeps coming back Mm -hmm. unfortunately uh now michelle does not participate in the film somewhat understandably since she isn't made out to be a very good person based on interviews with uh, some family members uh you said you actually grew up near her sean do you have any insight or indication of what she thinks of the book michelle remembers these days you know, the last interview that uh, we could find with her was, I think, in 1991 or 92, the last time that she talked about the book, and it was on the CBC. <laughs> I mean, you'll see clips of it in the film. It's quite the interview. Uh, and then after that, she sort of vanished. I know I can tell I can some stuff that we couldn't include in the film. Her and Larry uh, started a, a, a nonprofit charity charity one of the two for um, 
people who are temporarily homeless in Victoria, giving them a place to stay. We found an interview of Michelle talking about that. I know that she taught some, um, she is, she was an artist in her own right and, and was a weaver, so created sort of fabric sculptures and she used to teach classes in Victoria and that's the last trace that I could find of her in maybe about 2010. Mm, interesting, okay. Well, that's good to know. Uh, yeah, sorry, that's that's a little probably off tangent, but there's, there's the whole... <laughs> I, I appreciate that. It's something that doesn't work as well as a coda in a film. It's like, now Michelle works as a weaver. <laughs> Uh, now, I was eight years old when the first Harry Potter book came out in 1997, and growing up, I remember how certain church groups and the like would accuse Rowling as trying to indoctrinate youth into satanic cults, which is as funny back then as it is today. Uh, so for a more lighthearted question, I'd love to know if either of you ha were ever interested in anything that the public or people close to you decried as being satanic. Well... I am gay, so <laughs> which a lot of people used to think was satanic, and still a lot of people do. So that's that's a big one. <laughs> I was gonna say too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but no long night spent playing Dungeons and Dragons as a kid or anything like that. Unfortunately, not. I no. I tried it once. It wasn't for me, but I can understand. Yeah, it's just also that same the belief that that kids playing Dungeons and Dragons were, was opening a portal to hell. And I don't know, it's something else. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> now your movie is screened at festivals such as South by Southwest, Hot Docs, Salem Horror Fest, Seattle International Film Festival, and now Fantasia. What can we expect from the film going forward? Is there a plan for a theatrical or streaming release for wider, wider audiences to be able to see it? Yeah, after Fantasia, we are going to launch the film theatrically in Canada. Uh, so that'll be launching August 11th. Uh, and there will be more dates announced as we progress through August. And then it'll go on streaming on CBC uh, Doc Channel October 1st. And then we also will have an announcement at Fantasia about more streaming uh, throughout North America. Oh, fantastic. That's really exciting. I'll have to make sure to, to share those for, uh, for when that's coming out. That's really exciting because I, I can't wait for more people to watch this movie. Thanks. We can't either. <laughs> us, us too. Thank you. Uh, and then lastly, is there anything that uh, the two of you are, are planning on working on? Have you started your, your next film or anything like that? Or are you still very much in the Satan Wants You uh, realm right now? No, we got to keep... Oh, I'm sure... Oh, <laughs> I was going to say, Satan's never going to leave us after this, let me yeah. tell you. <laughs> but we're, also, we're hustling. We have a, a few different projects in development right now uh, that we're looking forward to sharing soon. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to that. I want to thank both of you very much for coming on today. It's been a huge pleasure and honor talking to both of you. Thanks. Today, I am joined by Toby Poser, Zelda Adams, John Adams, and Lulu Adams, the family team who run the company Wonder Wheel Productions, where they craft DIY independent horror films. The family has now produced eight films, with its latest, where The Devil Roams just had its world premiere at the Fantasia Film Festival. Welcome, Toby, Zelda, John, and Lulu. How are you all doing today? Hey, Dakota. Thanks for having us. We're good. Yeah, yep. so excited to be here. Excellent. Uh, this is your third time premiering your films at Fantasia after The Deeper You Dig in 2019 and Hellbender in 21. Uh, what about the festival keeps you coming back and giving the world premieres to these Montreal crowds? That's the answer right there, what you just said, these Montreal crowds, right? Yeah, the like the community here is just so welcoming. Like, they really watch our films with a keen eye and want to have conversations about it. And it just warms our heart. And also Mitch is just so incredible. Like we always, whenever we're making our films, we're wondering like, will Mitch like this? Will he like this? Like, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. He's such a film connoisseur. It's always just so wonderful to hear his thoughts. He's always the first person to put eyes on our films because we respect him so much. And he also Fantasia and Mitch, changed our lives. You mentioned the deeper you dig. Well, our lives changed with Fantasia and the deeper you dig. Oh, wow. That's really awesome to hear that then. 
Um, from what I gather, this is the, the biggest cast you've employed yet. You, you populate the film with other carnival performers and attendees. And, and because you're constantly on the road, that requires new people for the family to interact with. Was it more difficult commanding a larger group of people or just a natural evolution and graduation as filmmakers? It was a natural evolution. A lot of the carnival attendees are our friends and family who over the years have just, they, they know us as the weird people who are always like shooting something bloody on the side of the road or walking into the market looking like we, you know, just slaughtered been, somebody, you know, met someone unfortunate. And, um, and so it's been, it is an evolution. They, for years they've said, Hey, can I be in your film? Well, this was their shot. And it was, it was easy and fun. And it, and it, it's sort of like having a, a, a visual, like, you know, snapshot of everyone you know and love and you will be able to celebrate them forever on this film well that's nice to hear um you you set this film in the depression era in the united states what was the factor for picking the 1930s as the era you want to tell the story in the depression is such a it's such a wonderful um era to mine for desperation you know everyone there was desperate and in a way, even these characters who do not so wonderful things, in a sense, there's a morality that you can understand that they're sort of sticking up for their for, for the low lives, the odds and ends. Uh, and and then in the space in two between the two wars, it just was rich, rich, rich field for us to mine. And we also feel that like Depression era America, at least, is very similar to present day America. There, a lot of the same issues are going on. There's homeless camps everywhere. There's feeling there's a complete disparity between rich and poor and and fundamental religion is on the rise there's a, just so many kind of parallels that are just fun to play with but rather than set it in today and and like get into discussions that we don't really want to get in it's better to set it in the depression where it comes with all this romance just the visuals of a black and white depression era image comes with a ton of dark romance mm. I also add though we are such visual thinkers like whenever we start coming up with an idea we immediately try to think about the visuals because that helps structure our story and something about the 1930s is just so dirty but also beautiful and one thing that we really wanted was for our next film to be body horror but also you we wanted people to like smell it and feel it and feel a little bit dirty while they were watching it so we felt like the 30s was a good time for that Nice. Did it pose any challenges when you were trying to gather things like costumes or props or when you were set decorating locations to make it look in like 1930s? Strangely not, because when we were on the Hellbender uh, festival tour, we just started hitting every secondhand thrift store we could find traveling across the States. And we just collected all these things and we realized, you know what, there's only so much you can do with some threads. And uh, so there was plenty to just mix and match and and make our own look and and so no it was less challenging than we thought there were there had been a lot of negativity well just the the budget of the wardrobe alone and we we realized no you can make it work <laughs> i think that's maybe the beauty of setting something in the depression era is you can have stuff that doesn't have to match all that well it could be more degraded it could yeah. have a whole bunch of different flaws to it and it'll still fit in yeah. I know, uh, I don't know what Lulu yeah. will say about this, but Lulu and I built the sets for it. And that it, what you just said is exactly true. And Lulu mentions it a, a lot in the interviews, which is like, we're not the greatest carpenters. And we're, we're, we, don't, we don't have the money to go buy fresh two by fours. So we're basically <laughs> pulling two by fours from the side of the road and little bits and pieces and putting them up. And, and then we're allowing our, set, our sets stay there so they get snowed on and rained on and everything else. They get stained. They catch on fire by mistake. So... By the, by the end of like where, when we're filming, it looks like a wreck, which is the way, if you look at those images from those carnies, they look like they are just put together by, well, they didn't have duct tape back then, but if they did, that's how they would have put them together. Mm -hmm. uh, now, sort of speaking of the, the, this behind the scenes aspect, I love seeing all the different photos that you post on social media showing how you make... Uh, either these pretty complicated practical or special effects. It's always so fascinating. Were there any in this film that you found particular that you're particularly proud of uh, that you can walk us through? Well, I'll say in I, I love the World War One flashbacks, and in the third dream, 
Um, it's actually Zelda's boyfriend, Jack, who, who has something very unfortunate happen to his head. And that was, that's a fun memory because it was brutally cold. The blood was freezing, so it was hard to flow. We had our wonderful special effects guy, Trey Lindsay, there with us. And he made these wonderful handmade pumps and contraptions. And it was just too cold for anything to work. And so we just, just got down and dirty and poured a lot of blood. And John just started sawing. So that's a really fun memory. I My favorite memory, actually, it was really difficult. And we worked really hard on it, was Lulu's death. You know how hard we worked on it? Because there's something very specific about it that we really wanted to capture. And I don't know, that's when she gets killed with something in the neck. And I'm not going to give it away because it's an image that we worked very hard for. And Lulu had to work in incredibly hard because she needed to be really still during a, a fast sequence because it had to actually happen. And so, well, not the death of Lulu, but the, <laughs> the, so it, the, I, I love the way it came out. It's one of the pieces of cinematography that I'm most proud of. Yeah, it was fun leading up to that too, not even to when Toby brought me to my demise. <laughs> um, even shooting it in the beginning with that mirror shot, trying to get that right. I feel like that was both so fun. It felt really like, do we get it? That we really want to get that. But also doing it was so funny to do because I had to swing an axe, like this old axe at my dad repeatedly. And I did have to swing it towards it. We didn't have like a fake old axe with that weight that would look like I was back in this big thing. So I had to keep hitting John and swinging it aimed right next to his face. So I would hit the bar. Luckily the kid is a great axe swinger. <laughs> <laughs> We've chopped a lot of wood in our day. So I was kind of like, remember, just no metal to skull. Like wood to back, wood to skull, no metal to skull. It's it's a very tiny request, not that big. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Chop, but don't actually chop. Mm, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I do have to say uh, that shot that you're talking about is probably my favorite shot in the film. Oh, uh, it, was, it was one I made sure to write down in my notes where I was like, ooh, uh, I won't. I won't reveal it because it is. A, it is a great one, but it was okay. one I was, I was very excited about. It really caught my eye. Thank you. Well, then it was completely worth it. Thank uh, you. All of it was worth it. Having an axe swung at your head repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> He's got some cool bruises, broken collarbones. It looks great. We'll show him broken collarbone next movie. <laughs> Great. Uh, now, this film features plenty of biblical references. Anytime you obviously invoke devil iconography, it immediately invokes religious illusions. But you also have the Mr. Tips character talk about how he made a deal with the devil and involved Abaddon, a Hebrew and Greek name for a place of destruction and angel of the abyss, uh, which is something I learned about. Uh, now, Seven, John, your character openly talks about his disdain for religion as well. What re research did you do in order to make as many allegories of faith in godlike powers while writing the script uh well in terms of the abaddon story yeah that it started with looking up just yeah dark angels and again and taking us to a place oh that means destruction yeah the the abyss and we're like boy this kind of rings a bell with this with this family and 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 the horrors of um the depression and then it just in terms of it was about uh for his acts it was really fun for me to take a deep dive into the bible it was like psalm 88 um some job and john was a religion major in college so we just kind of took an axe to religion and the bible ourselves to kind of put together his um his act recitations and then we just and, we, and making the story of the fallen angel as a romance was kind of fun and realizing that the devil is kind of like these people he, to the devil, when it climbs its way out of hell to be on earth, it disguises itself as a pauper so that it's disguised under the lazy eyes of God, you know, which I thought, what a wonderful image for these people that God doesn't even see, um, see the odds and ends. Mm -hmm. And Gnosticism plays a big role in this because Gnosticism, what's interesting about Gnosticism is it says, hey, everything you've learned from the religious institution, it's the exact opposite. And that can sound subversive and like, oh, devil worshiping. But actually, when you really get into what Gnosticism is saying, it's quite beautiful. It's like saying, hey, knowledge and light are good things. Eve did take those things. So Eve, it becomes more of a like a female empowering religion because in Gnosticism, Eve was smart to bite the apple and get knowledge. And so it's like, I think what's fun about this movie, or we hope what's fun about this movie is the discussion of 
the gray area between good and evil. Like when you use fundamental religion to explain things, it's just good and evil. And you and the gray areas, you say, no, you have to have a leap of faith. Don't talk about the gray area. But we want to talk about the gray area. And the devil is the perfect way to do it because it's the human beast. It's 666. Humans are the sixth number. It's like, where does the devil play? The devil plays in the human realm. Where does God play? Outside of the human realm. And so it becomes just something you have to talk about. And it's a great thing to talk about because it's beautiful and it's been talked about forever. Well, I thought it was a really fresh approach. So it was nice to see uh, something different as far as that angle goes too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I think sort of the, the natural movie comparison to make when you're watching a carnival themed horror is the 1932 movie freaks. I sort of especially felt that way given a scene at the very end that I really don't want to spoil. Uh, I'd love to know what sort of inspirations you use for this movie, whether it is other films or something else altogether. You know, I don't think any of us here has ever even seen freaks. Really? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. you'll be in for a treat then. <laughs> yeah. It's always been like the top of my list for some reason. I just hold off. Um, we, um, I happen, I love German expressionism. I really do love the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. I mean, and if you think of those black and white movies, the Nosferatu mm -hmm. vampire, I mean, when we watch those, our eyes are kind of, you know, just come out of our sockets. And so I think while we weren't trying to emulate them, we, um, we, I think they definitely get into our subconscious and, and, particularly here too, the use of blackness, the darkness. I think there's a certain claustrophobia to the darkness of this film that reminded, reminds me of Black Box Theater, which I really enjoyed as an actor, as a theater actor. So those were influences that meant a lot to me. You wanna? Yeah, I remember watching uh, The Artist and seeing it gradually grow into color as you know the story started to grow and come alive. And I, it, that really stuck with me and I really wanted to make a film that turned to black and white because it kind of counters that idea of things coming alive. Things are getting really, really dead in this film and things are not going so well. So I wanted to kind of flip that idea on its side visually. Yeah. And uh, lastly, um, I, we, Toby mentioned Vampire. We watched Vampire and I thought this might be the greatest movie I've ever seen. And, um, and I was like, God, I'd love to, it's too bad we can't shoot something in black and white. And Zelda was like, well, we can. And then Zelda demanded, like, we did shoot it in color. And it looked so beautiful in color. I was like, I don't want to turn it to black and white anymore. And Zelda was like, no, 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 no. We're turning it to black and white. And she demanded it. And in the end, it's the, it's my favorite thing about the cinematography is what happens to the movie as it progresses. Nice. Uh, now, Zelda, other than singing, I don't believe your character speaks at all during the film. Uh, what new challenges did you face when having to do most of your acting without the use of words? I thought it was such a fun, wonderful acting practice because all of my other roles, you know, I've spoken. And this was very, very new to me, learning to, like, act with tiny movements. And, like, she's also a very angelic character that, you know, doesn't move quick. So it was so fun getting to play this character. And might I say also easy because I didn't have to memorize any lines. That was kind of <laughs> nice. Um, but, you know, we did realize it was super crucial for her character to have something to rely on her parents for. Because we were wondering, like, if maybe if I were Eve, I'd be leaving this family. They're kind of messed up. This family, like, why isn't she getting out of there? And I think her lack of a talking voice gives her a reason to stick around. You know, she needs her parents. But we did also want uh, two things. We wanted her to be able to communicate in some way, and that's through her <clears throat> puppets, her dolls, and also through her singing voice. And her singing voice was also an avenue for our band, Hellbender. We wanted a way to be able to share or uh, play our music in the film, so that was one of our ways. Well, that is a great transition because the next question I was going to ask was about the band. Uh, now, you uh, obviously said, said created a band called Hellbender and appeared in your last film of the same name. And it served as both a plot device for something for the mother and daughter to do to connect and also a function as a vessel for the soundtrack. Uh, and then you you brought the family band back for this movie once again to act in this on the soundtrack. Can you talk about bringing the band back and how you approach writing music for a different style of movie? What do you think, Will? I think we've always kind of said that the music is the backbone and a lot of it is done kind of around that music that we create. 
and just got really into the kind of eerie angelic creepy thing like just being in that environment so much i think just added to any of those songs made throughout yeah and one of the things we really wanted to do with this movie was have a specific like with hellbender we were kind of all over the place musically we were just having fun like doing anything we wanted we could do a ballad or we could do a industrial punk song and and we mixed them all and it really felt like it really worked well but in this we had a big discussion about let's try to make a sound so that like there's a similar tone that we the bass stays the same the drum stays the same and we lay those angelic vocals over the top and um so that was really fun because we had a mission so we started recording songs with a mission in mind a tone to set this movie to and it was a wonderful process and these girls voices together to me is just just kind of magical I like to say that John and Toby tried to make their dream band by having us. Like, oh, let's get all the spectrum. Okay, this one maybe can't get to this level or that level. Let's try another one. Okay, uh -huh. another girl. Great. Sweet. Okay, she can get here. She's yeah. got this <gasps> voice. <laughs> it corrects me up. Very nice. Uh, <laughs> well, I love the music on the soundtrack once again. It, it fits the movie perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. That's really great. <laughs> now, I know that you've announced that the film will be playing at a few other festivals, but I'd love to know what the future is of the movie. Uh, are you going to do like a full festival run? Is it going to be streaming, a theatrical release, anything like that you can talk about yet? Yeah, we're going to do another festival run. That's the highlight of making a movie is like getting something into a festival is, is kind of the cherry on top. So we'll definitely be hitting some of our favorites. And then probably in the fall, it'll start hitting some streaming um, and, uh, you know, transactional video platforms. Nice. Well, I'm very excited for more people to be able to see this then. Thank, thanks thanks so much. And thanks for, so much for like your great eyes on, on our film. I want to thank Stephen J. Adams, Sean Horler, and Route 504 PR for setting up the Satan Wants You interview, and Toby Poser, John, Zelda, and Lulu Adams, alongside Caitlin PR for setting up the Where the Devil Roams interview. Check the show notes for more information on these films and my reviews. Stay tuned because we have more Fantasia Festival coming your way in the next week. This has been a That Shelf podcast. Visit thatshelf.com for more great film discourse. Follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and threads at ContraZoomPod. What have you seen at Fantasia Festival? Send us an email, ContraZoomPod at gmail.com. Thank you to Eric and Kevin Smale for the theme music and to Stephanie Pryor for the logo design. If you like to listen to podcasts on YouTube, we do post all episodes there as well. And if you really like the show, consider tipping us on coffee. Thanks for checking us out. This is Zelda Adams, the filmmaker, one of the many film. No, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to call uh, it. Cut. Right. Cut. All right. <laughs> this is how we make films. Now you're just watching, right? <laughs>